Hey kids, before we dive in, I'd like to give big ups to Magic Spoon for sponsoring today's episode. It's no secret I loves me some cereals, so it's why I've been enjoying the magic that's contained within these spoons. They have zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and are only 140 calories per serving. And they're also keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and are very low in carbs. What they ain't low on is taste. I've been enjoying the frosted version as well as the new honey nut flavor. Ooh, how delightfully devilish, Matthew. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you're not satisfied, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So, if you want to get some fun new options for your midnight snacking, order yourself a box or build your own variety pack, and to save $5 off that order, use the code MCMUSCLES at checkout or go to magicspoon.com slash McMuscles. Thanks again, Magic Spoon, and without further ado, let's start the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of What Happened, the show that once again examines upcoming release lists to see what algorithmic synergy it can harness. And just my luck, there's another new Jurassic Park movie I'm not gonna watch, so why don't we take a look back at the prehistoric franchise's bumpy foray into first-person shooters, Trespasser. The game was dreamed up by a bunch of young, ambitious minds that truly wanted to make something different, and it would end up being positioned as the game that would revolutionize the FPS genre, and perhaps even the industry at large. Sometimes though, you can't force things to happen, and this unique, ahead of its time project proved to be one of those things. Instead of becoming one of the many blockbuster products spun off from Michael Crichton's world, it wound up being one of the most infamous. So grab your cans of whipped cream, or apparently it's shaving cream, I I thought it was whipped cream as a child, okay? And put on your adventuring fedora, it's time to find out what happened to Trespasser. Wait, it's it's Trespasser the Lost World? No, it's Trespasser the Lost World Jurassic Park? Uh, Okay. That is one big pile of shit. DreamWorks Interactive opened in 1995 with backing from both the fledgling DreamWorks Pictures and Microsoft. They planned to make a splash in the PC gaming space and to do so, they decided to make some incredibly smart hires, including Looking Glass Studio vets, Seamus Blackley, and Austin Grossman. The team in general were mostly composed of people who were all jazzed up and looking to make the next big thing during a very exciting time in the industry. They saw the first person shooter explode in popularity, but felt the core gameplay loop they were all emulating was a bit limited in scope. Almost all of them were speedy, straightforward slaughter fests through mazes of hallways that always ended with a results screen, which was the style, y- you know. Blackley, having previously worked on games including System Shock and Flight Unlimited, wanted to bring a new level of freedom to the FPS, and envisioned a game that featured an emphasis on exploration rather than clear times and kill counts. With the rapid growth of 3D games at the time, he and his team felt this was something they could achieve, and thus they successfully pitched a game based on these vague concepts to the execs at DreamWorks. Originally, this was going to be an all-new IP, but it was going to take time and it was going to be expensive. While the producers at DreamWorks were supportive, they of course had a caveat. The game had to be based on Jurassic Park in some way, as it was rather a hot property since the first had been such a hit and the law World was gearing up for a release in 1997. Fortunately, the team were more than fine with attaching an existing franchise to their concept, as Jurassic Park's outdoor tropical locations would provide a setting that worked for what they were going for. And so, they crafted an original story that would actually fall after the events of The Lost World. Aside from having to feature dinosaurs, they were given free reign to explore the core ideas they were dreaming up. An immersive adventure which dispensed with typical video games game tropes like power-ups, corridor-based level design, and ammo counters. They would instead embrace design elements that would allow the player to succeed and survive at their own pace as they reach the end goal, a climactic helicopter rescue at the summit of Site B, aka Isla Sorna. This development plan, however, only came about in 1996, leaving very little time to get the game ready for the film's 97 premiere, but DreamWorks were cool with that. There were already no less than eight 
eight other games based on the Lost World in production, including a bizarrely gorgeous 16-bit affair on the Genesis, a 2.5D action game for 32-bit consoles, and an arcade shooter, so the Trespasser team had plenty of time, at least initially, to make good on their innovative ideas. The targeted release date for the game was whenever it was finished, frankly, and they would need all that time, because the two big elements, Blackley and the team wanted to focus on, were not your everyday back-of-the-box features. The first was a series of complex AI routines that would govern each species of dinosaur, and it was going to affect a lot of different behaviors, far more than any other game at the time. The dinos obviously have to be the stars of the show when it comes to anything with the JP mark, so the team wanted them to feel like living, breathing creatures. To achieve this, they would need to bring a variety of behaviors to life. Hunger, thirst, curiosity, aggressivity, you know, dinosaur vibes. While that was complicated enough on its own, the other main element planned for the game was a robust physics system with a meaningful amount of player interaction, which again, no other game had done up to this point. The main purpose was to let the player manipulate objects in real time to solve dynamic puzzles in order to progress through the game. Structures which could realistically crumble and break would also frame an exciting set-piece encounter with a T-Rex as it would tear through a building to attack the player. While this all sounds great on paper, Seamus Blackley was planned to handle the entire physics system by himself along with his production role, as it was something he was personally passionate about. Much like the AI issue, there were no blueprints on how to make all of this function, and most teams would realize this was more than enough work to make for a full experience. I mean, they were developing two entirely different innovations that no one else had attempted at this level. So, I guess there's no reason to worry, right? Okay, so uh, let's start with the AI. Once they had implemented the main routines that make each dinosaur go, there was a bit of a problem. When a dinosaur had enough attributes nudging it in a different direction, the team noticed that they wouldn't do much of anything at all. The system was going to need a lot of work, and Trespasser's intricate dino DNA wasn't something they would wind up having time to fix. So that's not good, and since Blackley was project lead, he had to help solve that issue, in addition to overseeing the rest of the game, so it meant progress on the physics system was falling well behind schedule. The player could interact with one object well enough, but once you started stacking objects or invoking the laws of friction, that's when the whole thing started to slip. Or, well, not slip. The friction didn't work, after all. The amount of pure math grinding against itself in large open 3D levels with dinosaurs running around, bearing in mind that the game was chiefly developed with software rendering, resulted in the game's frame rate slowing down to a crawl. This meant that the physics would also need months and months of additional work, and there was only one guy who was working on it. These tech issues also plagued design in different ways. The team's original idea was for the playable character and to be able to manipulate objects and weapons with two hands, but with the physics system so behind, it was felt limiting this to just one limb would be the safer bet. Thus, a narrow explanation was drafted up. Anne's left arm would be broken during the beginning of the game, and everything the player did would be done exclusively by her mouse-controlled right arm. This didn't mean her broken appendage simply swayed around all limp and weird, oh no, that's because if you pull the camera out, Anne is simply a floating husk composed of her right arm and a mighty pair of yabos. The team's intention here was to have as unobtrusive of a UI as possible, with Anne and tracking her health by looking down at the heart tattoo on her left arm, but with that appendage out of action, they went with the next best choice? Despite that hiccup, this was all part of the team's plan to provide a more immersive experience for the player. Instead of a health counter, they would need to manually check their status themselves. If they wanted to know how many bullets were left in their weapon, and would actually comment on it vocally. Almost gone. 
that's it. This leads us to one of the few things that went extremely right with Trespasser, namely the handling of the Jurassic Park IP. Actress Minnie Driver was cast in the role of Anne, as well as the late Richard Attenborough reprising his role as John Hammond. The inclusion of the father of Jurassic Park was done via a new concept called audio logs, where Anne recalled passages of Hammond's book whenever she arrived at predetermined areas. My name is John Parker Hammond. I was born on March 14, 1928. These were generally well regarded by critics and consumers alike, as it was felt they injected a genuine sense of authenticity to the proceedings. Aloof space wizard John Carmack apparently cited Trespasser as an inspiration for Doom 3, opting to tell much of its story through audio logs. Huh. The more you know. Normally, by this time in the video, I would have introduced the stuffy executive that didn't know the difference between a polygon and a pixel, bursting into the office going, What the fuck is going on here, Blackley? And ruining the game. But that apparently didn't happen with Trespasser. All throughout 1997, the team were left to their own devices, with DreamWorks top brass staying very hands-off, probably because they simply didn't know much about video games. This lack of management is unfortunately something that hurt the project, because sometimes you do need another experienced set of eyes to take an objective look at what's not worth slamming your head into over and over. With zero oversight, the team struggled well into 19 1998, with just about everything making incredibly sluggish progress, until those same execs that had never bothered the team before came to bother the team with some catastrophic news. DreamWorks Interactive, as it turns out, had signed a lucrative deal with AMD, and part of that initial deal was to have a big name product out the door by the latter half of 1998. And guess which struggling PC FPS was going to be that product? This meant absolutely everything had to be simplified or cut completely to make the date. And I don't just mean the systems that weren't working, I mean actual content. The epic T-Rex encounter mentioned earlier, gone. On. A harrowing third act that would have had you sprint up a dangerous mountainside was reduced to a leisurely stroll. Puzzles, locations, items, dialogue, weapons, a ton of other dinosaurs, anything that wasn't already made and finished was effectively thrown to the primordial slash digital soup. Let's circle back around to the two big components that, for all intents and purposes, made up the core of Trespasser, the physics and AI. The team's only goal was now to just make something that worked, so they had to dial back all the ambition they were shooting for at the start. The various Vegisauruses had their behavior simply set to passive. They didn't attack the player, they didn't drink or eat, they just kinda wandered around, oblivious to the complex intellectual patterns they're once destined to have. Got nothing in my brain. Meanwhile, Metasauruses were dialed up to 11, set to attack and chase the player the second they see them with their subpar intelligence and movement abilities tempering their berserker rage. This binary design was the exact opposite of what the team had hoped to achieve, lifelike AI behavior that displayed nuance and variety. The physics and the associated puzzles also had to be scrapped or boiled down to their simplest form. Puzzles that may well have involved multi-part tasks were reduced to simply moving single objects around or knocking things down really really slowly. Engaging more than one physics object at a time could prove to be quite troublesome, so it was broadly avoided in the design. Seamus Blackley recalled the sudden release mandate being particularly devastating, especially since he estimated that the game needed roughly a full year or even more to be finished. With every feature or idea that was cut out, with every level that was stitched together with another in ways they didn't intend, the team knew the game was getting worse and worse, and falling further from their original vision. They desperately tried to salvage what they had, but it was like a band-aid on a bullet hole, or rather, a giant bite from a T-Rex. Simply put, Trespasser was released unfinished when it shipped to stores in October of 1998. The game was seen, ironically, as a lumbering dinosaur, when compared to things like Quake 2 and Unreal, and was uh, significantly outclassed by Half-Life, which released just a few weeks 
weeks later. Review outlets and magazines were generally not too kind, with many labeling it as the worst game of the year. Some reviewers pointed to the positives where the game succeeded, along with its ambitious nature, but these positives were very broadly overshadowed by criticism. Trespasser also didn't sell very well. A vague 50,000 unit sales figure is often found associated with it, but when asked about this figure, Seamus Blackley recalled the game's sales being closer to 87,000 copies, making it arguably one of the least successful Jurassic Park branded spin-off products of all time. And considering Warpath exists, that's one hell of an accomplishment. What was more of an accomplishment was how much money DreamWorks had spent during the game's nearly three years of development, which was estimated between six and seven million dollars, which in 1998 video game money might as well have been a billion. Spare no expense. The team quietly disbanded shortly after the first patch went out, which while it did fix some severe crashes and progression blockers, it didn't make the game much more enjoyable. Several staff members stayed, just as many left, but DreamWorks Interactive lingered on for a few more years, developing Typhoo Wrath of the Tiger and then the original Medal of Honor, before being sold to Electronic Arts and rebranded as EA Los Angeles. There they would go on to make several more Medal of Honor. GoldenEye Rogue Agent, and Boom Blocks. Oh, hey Steven, what's up? They then changed their name again to Danger Close Games before finally being closed by EA after the disastrous launch of Medal of Honor Warfighter. Whoa, remember that one? In 2012. Seamus Blackley, however, left long before all that. While he was distraught over Trespasser's failure, he was contacted by one Billy Bill Gates Shabadoo, who had actually seen Trespasser and was in impressed with the game's ambition. Blackley was offered the position of program manager working on DirectX, and not too long after that, he suggested that Microsoft enter the home console market to directly take on companies like Sony. Blackley was put at the head of the Xbox project, putting together the teams and overseeing the launch of what would become one of the big three names in the console space. So yeah, safe to say, Trespasser's poor launch and subsequent infamy didn't hold him back too much. But there's more to the game's legacy. Several developers, including Gabe Newell himself, cited Trespasser as a direct influence on the physics-heavy gameplay that powered Half-Life 2, and expressed that without Trespasser, Half-Life 2 would have been a very different game. It also wasn't only game developers that had noticed Trespasser's positives. As several passionate fan groups that have come and gone over the years, the most famous being Trustcom, have cataloged and made available all the history, mods, patches, and improvements Trespasser has been getting for the last 20 years. So clearly, while the initial release was certainly not looked upon very favorably back in its day, Trespasser's legacy has endured through the communities that sprung up around it, and the games that learned and built off both its incredible wealth of ideas and points of failure. Trespasser itself is a testament to the idea that ultimately, uh, life, uh, finds a way. If you know of any other extinct video games or movies that might require further examination, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or enter the theme park that is my Patreon and become a big dino boss and nominate what's coming up. See you next time and thanks for watching!